All right. So it is six o'clock. We will call this meeting to order. And, oh, yes, Angel. I was just going to ask um, Kelly if he could send the link to the person I'm going to put in the chat right now. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's Renee. I'm gonna send it directly to you. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, Susie. No, you're good. Okay. Uh, oh, I sent it to her already. She should be. She she said she did not receive it. Yeah, she called me right now. She said she couldn't find it. Okay. But it's like a million emails and they probably got buried, you know? Right. <laughs> All righty. Well, go ahead. The floor is on. Awesome. Um, let's see. We have um, how many members this evening? One, two, three, four. Um, so we do have a quorum. So we're good there. Um, let's see. Um, uh, we do have brown rules, as everybody knows. We're be respectful. We won't talk over each other. Um, uh, we'll keep uh, mind somebody better than me um, of the chats, because as you all know, I'm not really great about multitasking that way. Um, we'll be respectful to our guests as well. Um, let's see. Everybody has the agenda that I emailed out. Um, are there any changes or amendments to the agenda? Yes, Mike. I would like perhaps two minutes at most to uh, discuss the opportunity to volunteer on the point in time survey of uh, people living on streets and in shelters. Okay, cool. And do you want to do that in new business? New business would be great. Okay, cool. So are there any other changes, additions? Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? I so move. So Ron second there, thank you very much. Um, you can just show of hands, approval. All right, so moved, awesome. Um, let's go straight into our presentation by uh, Maria Wolf with uh, Safety Public Safety Echo Project, and I will hand the floor to you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Southeast Community Policing Council. Um, Kelly, do I have uh, screen sharing privileges? You do now. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, I just have a very brief presentation that gives you an overview of the um, Public Safety Echo program. And then I uh, am happy to take questions and uh, have a little discussion about what we're trying to do and see if anybody has ideas and specifics that we should bring to the table. Um, and uh, it's uh, just great to have this opportunity to come to this group. I think I came to you when we were just kicking off close to a year ago. And um, so it's uh, great to be back again. Um, here is our presentation. Um, and does everybody see the slide that I Think is up that says public safety echo. Excellent. It's always nice when Zoom works the way we think it should. Um, the public safety echo program was started um, close to three years ago, and um, it was started first in downtown, and now it is in both the downtown area and the Knob Hill uh, slash University area, and. Uh, the Knob Hill University Public Safety Echo started in, um, we started working on it last spring and we kicked it off last summer. 
the ECHO model, um, a lot of people uh, are like, what the heck is ECHO? And so this is a program that uh, started at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine uh, close to 30 years ago now. And it, um, ECHO actually stands for Extension of Community Health Outcomes. It was developed by a doctor who is a hepatitis specialist, and he found that rural doctors were um, sending patients to him, um, and those patients were going to die because um, the doctors didn't have the expertise in this specialty. And instead of trying to see more and more patients, which was impossible for the doctor, he decided to build the capacity amongst the specialists, the practitioners in those areas to be able to better serve and to know best practices. Fast forward 30 years and you have the ECHO project in every school of medicine across the country. You have it in 9,000 cities in the US, 180 countries, and they are addressing not just medical issues like hepatitis, but they're looking at things like autism, uh, traumatic brain injury, and they've been a specialist in the last couple of years on sharing best practices with COVID, um, COVID treatment, COVID um, prevention, and especially they had a huge grant to work on um, trying to get disease uh, prevention practices put into nursing homes across the United States. So it gives you an idea of how the ECHO project has been working. They have an excellent reputation for sharing best practices and problem solving um, because what they really have specialized in since the beginning is moving knowledge, not people. That's one of their uh, taglines. Another one is that everybody teaches, everybody learns. And so in the ECHO project, you have every session a presentation, but you also have learning where everybody at the table can share their experience, their ideas, other solutions that might address it from a multidisciplinary problem solving approach. <clears throat> the ECHO project has always used technology um, to amplify access to the information. So um, when we all went to Zoom when with the shutdowns a couple of years back now, um, this was a program that just kept going because we always had a technology foundation for the work we were doing. Echo, um, in their COVID training, they've had, they'll, they'll sometimes have 2,000 people tuning in to find out the latest on the research. And they're from across the globe, literally from, at, from every continent except Antarctica. I don't know, maybe Antarctica started tuning in at the end. But um, so they they amplify access. They um, they drop down the silo of information by having access as easy as a phone call, an internet connection to zoom in. They've been using Zoom for years and years. Um, then they really work on sharing best practices to reduce that disparity of um, the people who have the knowledge or don't have the knowledge by really. Uh, making sure that people can listen in, have access, and then share their learning as well. It's, it's not just a class where you have a, a webinar presentation, but we have the case-based learning where people bring an actual issue to the table, and then everybody who's in the session has an opportunity to participate. Now, I have to say that since they started having like the 2,000 people uh, participating in the recent things, it's been a little different. They've had a more panelist approach, but in a typical ECHO session, you would have everybody at the table having the opportunity for a voice. Um, the, an example of the case-based learning is in the yesterday's um, Knob Hill ECHO session. Um, the case was talking about a, a business in the Knob Hill area that had had a number of robberies. And so, um, they they were by the same individual um, and we were able to bring to the table information from the policing side from the um from the video real-time crime center side and how videos could be used in that situation how to share videos when you have something happen 
um, on your property or in your business. And, and um, then looking at uh, potential uh, crime solutions from crime prevention specialists that are part of the area command. Um, and just, it, and then also um, looking at things that are happening in the area in terms of the environment um, issues like that. Um, then the other key part of the ECHO program is that you are um, constantly just like, we, we don't just have a session, but we track exactly who's attending, how many sessions they've attended, try to get regular feedback from individuals, um, and try to have as much data building as you can to look at what's working or not working for the participants who are trying to benefit from the learning and the shared best practices. Um, so again, you know, the why the ECHO, it's because of the application with the use of technology, shared best practices, case-based learning. So it can be something as uh, dramatic as a robbery, but it could also be something that's just a little bit more cautious, like another case we had in the Knob Hill um, UNM uh, University Echo was a person was sitting on a neighbor's porch and um, the neighbor didn't know they were there. They weren't there at the neighbor's invitation. Um, other neighbors saw what was happening. What are, what's the best way to handle a situation like this? Do you call 911? Do you call 242 cops? Um, you know, what are the opportunities for learning that all the neighbors could share in a situation like this? Or um, a, another case was um, how can we get help for a person in the family who has an addiction issue? Is the law enforcement assisted diversion program um, something that community members can use or is it really only for law enforcement officers? And so learning more about the LEAD program and um, what we now know is called a social referral and exactly how to make a social referral so that other people can be helped, not just family members, but people that we know in the community who might need help as well. So there's a couple of examples of cases that have come up in um, the Knob Hill, the UNM uh, ECHO program. Um, Another part uh, that's important about what we're trying to do is that it's really, um, uh, it's not just having a program and having the session, but it's really building those partnerships with that multidisciplinary problem solving group. So for um, the Knob Hill to University Echo, we're not just working with APD officers, but we're also working with UNM officers. We're working with ACS teams. We're working with Solid Waste and we're working with um, the Parks Division and we're working with um, the Hope Works and the Albuquerque Street Connect uh, team. We're working with, you know, VIP when we can. And, you know, we're working with a wide variety of people who are trying to make a difference in the same, in our city, trying to help people um, feel good about their community and feel safe. Uh, so uh, the key thing that this um, infographic is showing is the importance of sort of the learning loops and then the partnering groups that are all part of the session with us. Um, we can't do this by ourselves, we have to do it together. And that's a really important part of what we're doing is working together, creating a problem solving environment um, with the key stakeholders and um, just members of our community and our neighborhoods. Um, and so this just lays out a little bit about some detail about how the key different roles are laid out in terms of looking at setting up an ECHO program. You have a hub team, um, that's that core team representing um, the people who have key roles in public safety. Um, then from that hub team, you go out to what we call the spokes. And so these are key um, stakeholders that support the group in the community. So solid waste, we don't have them in our hub team, but they're an absolute key member of the community, making communities feel safe because they're, they're clean and they're well-kept and maintained environments. Um, then uh, from the spokes, you have 
stakeholders. You have, you know, city councilors or you have neighborhood association um, leaders, or you have um, school uh, PTO or PTA representatives. You have University of New Mexico safety committee representatives. These are people who are with organizations as a volunteer or professional basis who, who bring key information to the table and bring potential solutions to the table or problems to the table. And then you have champions, people who just want to um, see this working throughout the community. And then what's not listed here is we just have all the other community members who want to be part of the solution or who want to learn more about how things are working and how people can work together. So again, it's all teach, all learn. This is just a little infographic showing you sort of that hub team along with those different spokes um, who are at the table with you. So, um, so when we think about how this got started, um, a lot of people said, why downtown? Why'd you start with downtown? And well, our downtown is a high concentration of um, people in an area who are working in an area. It's our it's part, we, we only have a couple of parts of the city that have high rises um, with a high density of population. With the high density of population, we also had a high concentration of crime per capita. And so it became a hot spot to start with. Um, and uh, so again, it's cross-disciplinary um, and in the city, it's, that means cross-departmental. Um, and so we're bringing together um, as many of the players as possible to solve problems. So when the Downtown Public Safety Echo first started, they did about six months worth of community meetings with various stakeholder groups and identified the curriculum that we focus on when it comes to those didactic learning presentations. And so skills training is a, a basic part of what we have throughout um, the program. And so we'll talk about specific skills like de-escalation training, um, reading body language, um, situational awareness as you're walking down the street or um, entering into an area active listening or interviewing. Um, there's a variety of specific skills that we can help people learn that make them feel more comfortable in their environment and um, better able to read a situation. Mental health, of course, is, a, is an important uh, curriculum area for us to understand what's going on with the people in our community who are struggling. And the more we understand sort of what is schizophrenia and what is a psychotic break and um, what, um, how can we uh, address people and reduce the stigma of mental illness and better able to um, approach each person with respect and dignity, it can only help us all in dealing with the environment that we're working within. Um, this slide says drug prevention. We, all, we actually call it um, you know, addiction or, or substance use awareness and stigma reduction again, because it's here, we just have to figure out better how to understand what's going on. Um, part of that is like learning what is methamphetamine? How does it impact the brain? How does it make people behave in the ways um, that it does. And then when we see somebody on the street behaving in various ways, how can we understand more why they're behaving that way? Because the more we understand why things are happening, the less it's scary, right? We hope, we hope that a higher level of understanding and knowledge reduces the fear factor involved. Um, so whether it's methamphetamine or fentanyl or um, opioid use disorder, alcoholism, you know, addictions are out there and they're real and, and they're a chronic illness. And so helping um, everybody understand the different ways of treating addiction or the different ways that addiction can impact behavior can help our community members live more comfortably in their environment. A big part of what we do is we also help everybody understand how does policing work? Like, what is lead? What is um, what is, uh, why do 
police officers set a perimeter around an area when they are dealing with a situation. Um, and a variety of, you know, like, why do we have a mounted patrol? Uh, and how do those horses get trained? Or um, how do we recruit officers? And how has that changed over the years? How, are, how do we train officers? Um, there, there just are a variety of things that the more people understand how it works and what the thinking is behind some of it, the more, again, you can feel more comfortable in dealing with that officer when you're encountering a situation. And so it builds trust and understanding the layers that we need in our community to work together well. Um, then finally, community improvement or community wellness is a big part of it. Um, so just understand like what's going on in terms of economic development or what's going on with um, the, you know, the events that are happening in our area or um, how are people working together. So community wellness can it's sort of a catch-all for quite a few things. Like for example, the downtown public safety echo um, next session is going to have the Albuquerque Film Department do a presentation on how they coordinate with police and fire um, when they're working on different um, locations and how do they do all of their coordination for films. And so it's kind of just an interesting topic that a lot of people are interested in, but it also ties back into how do you coordinate for safety when you have events and programs or films in your neighborhood. Um, so then uh, a lot of people, uh, when we moved up uh, and added a second ECHO program and did the second ECHO program in the Nob Hill University area, they said, well, why there? Why not, you know, here or there um, that might have a higher impact? And so part of the reason for um, expanding to that area was um, that this was a program that had a lot of the same partners that we had success with in the downtown area. So um, we had the Heading Home Street Connect working in that area. We had block by block the street ambassadors that are so active downtown, um, also in the Knob Hill area. Um, the Knob Hill area had a PRT team with a bike team um, doing more direct outreach to the um, businesses and to the community members. And so, um, and then those kinds of things were very clear partnerships that had worked well in the downtown area. And so replicating in an area that had similar partnerships made a lot of sense in terms of being able to make it work fairly quickly and then the city can um, decide where to go next when, when we have the opportunity to expand the program. So when we went up to the Knob Hill area in terms of how to design it, we, we did a Knob Hill survey, a safety survey and concern survey. Um, we uh, did some Zoom sessions with stakeholders through the neighborhood associations and the business groups and um, we, we sought input with uh, direct outreach to the businesses and to the neighborhood associations during that process. Um, really the ultimate goal of the Public Safety Echo is to really help our community members come together um, and proactively solve problems that are impacting their sense of personal safety or community safety and to build trust and partnering. And um, that's really the bottom line goal that we have for each of these sessions. Um, so public safety echo so far, we've had 93 sessions. I mean, you can read through all of these stats that are here. Uh, we have over 3000 total attendees, um, 623 who attend multiple sessions. Uh, 73 cases have been addressed, 93 presentations. You can see the variety of topics that are covered and um, what we have coming up um, in uh, the next uh, couple of months um, are, is on that slide. So um, uh, then um, when we do our surveys of people afterwards, 
Um, we have a high level of agreement that people find that the sessions um, help them and apply to their interactions in their daily life downtown and that they provided resources um, that were helpful for the downtown community and we you can do like what are the keywords that pop up most often and you can see here you you have a lot of um, detailed understanding engaging um, informative um, so you, you can kind of get an idea of, of the feedback that we're getting from these sessions. So Knob Hill, we've had 15 sessions so far, had over 500 total attendees, addressed 12 cases. Um, I think we have um, about, I wanna, oh, I have to go back because that, 523 total attendees is how many are on each session. So that's not necessarily individual people because we'll ha we have a high level of regular attendees who are attending every session at this point. Um, we've had presentations on um, homeless intervention programs, the APD Real-Time Crime Center, um, violence intervention programs, thanks to Angel who presented for that. Um, and a, you can see the variety of other programs. Um, what we have coming up is talking about trauma and triggers for trauma and how to deal with somebody who's been triggered, uh, peer support um, and treatment, um, social referrals and um, lead and getting more into detail on that as a follow up to the case with a formal presentation. Um, we're always, uh, you know, trying to figure out that nice balance between providing information on how policing works, addiction and substance use, mental health, community wellness, and then specific skills training. So we'll definitely be getting um, a presentation on de-escalation again in there soon. Um, and we'll also be looking at um, some of the, uh, looking at schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, and some of the impact of um, addiction on mental health since a lot of people have a co-occurring issue. And um, again, uh, in terms of feedback on the um, program, we have a high level of agreement that the uh, program brings value to the people who participate. And um, you know, the keywords are smaller because we don't have as many uh, of them, but uh, they, they feel like it's helpful um, and we get pretty positive feedback. When something doesn't work, we definitely hear about it. Recent responses let us know that the presenter who wore a mask during his presentation, it was very difficult for him to understand. So we'll definitely be paying attention to that and making sure we don't have that issue in the future. Um, so what's next? Um, we're going to, you know, continue working with these communities, try to expand the audience, um, but we'll also be, um, you know, trying to look at how best to move forward. Um, and uh, one thing that is a change for the program, which I think is really positive, is that in the past we have said, you know, the downtown echo is really for the downtown community. And the Knob Hill University echo is really for the Knob Hill University community. And I, I want you all to know that what we want to do is make sure that everybody feels welcome to attend any of these sessions and learn from them. Um, we will continue to do more intensive outreach, that face-to-face, boots-on-the-ground outreach um, in these communities and be very community-focused. But we want you know anybody who is interested in learning about these topics to feel like they can participate and so anybody is welcome who's a part of our community um i think that's the highlights of what i was trying to do so uh if anybody uh, i'll put my email in the chat i'm happy to answer any questions and i'm happy to add anybody to the invitation list for the programs. Uh, we send out a specific invitation so you know what topics are being covered. Um, so you can opt in or opt out um, at any point that you like. Um, are there any questions or um, concerns? Thank you, Maria. Yeah. That was really informative. I have a question. Uh, you gave an example 
early in your presentation, Maria, about the, the guy that was sitting on the porch and the communication around the neighborhood. How, what was the resolution on that situation? Yeah, so, um, so with the input with everybody at the table, there was a high level of agreement that um, if somebody in the neighborhood knew it was happening, then um, if you don't have reason to believe that this person is dangerous, that keeping a safe distance, it's good to, to call, to have a couple of neighbors join you and call out to the person. Um, and say, hi, you know, are you here, you know, to see somebody special? Um, and this is just an approach where you can try to address the situation in a, in a community way, because the neighbors were right there and they already knew it was happening. They called the neighbor, asked her, and she said she didn't know somebody was there and she was surprised and asked for them to help. They did help. Um, and so the question was, is that the best thing to do? And the answer was, you know, it depends on the situation and how you feel about what's going on and how the person responds to that initial response. Um, then uh, if the response is not something where that person responds to the community members, then the next step is to go that, that route of calling for help. And so you can, if you feel at risk and there's an indication of a potential for violence, you're always gonna call 911 because it's scary and it's happening right now. Um, if uh, there is not a violent, but you just need some help, you have opportunities of 242 cops or using what I always am encouraging people to use is that um, APD app. Um, because that's a very straightforward way of, you know, the neighbors could literally take a picture of that person on the porch, submit the, uh, what's happening, ping the address, get it out. Um, and uh, then uh, there was an encouragement that if there was an option to have a photo where you knew who it was, that you could submit it and then APD would know that this individual has done this. And if it's happening at more than one house or happening across the board, they know what's happening. Knowledge is helpful. Um, also, um, now that information could also be shared with the new community safety department as well. So um, I don't know if I'm remembering everything uh, that was brought up in that situation, but during the session, when we're talking about options, um, one of my uh, jobs, my role is to just frantically type and try to capture as clearly as possible what the suggestions and solutions are. And then that is sent out as a follow up to everybody who participated in the program that day. And so it's there. Um, the information is also going on the website that we have for it. Um, but I have to tell you, I, I always tell people it's like running up the down escalator. I'm always behind on getting the videos and the solutions onto the website in a timely way, but the, the information is captured. So in that particular situation, was APD called through 911 or 242 cops or was it handled by the neighbors and the fellow was escorted off the property off the porch or what was someone else called so in that situation specifically what happened is that a couple of neighbors called out to the person from the sidewalk and said hey you know can we help you what are you doing here and the person um was not responsive to him, them but he wandered off is is how it was described to me and so it was not reported, it was not captured. Um, so, so there's not a record that this individual had done this. So we don't know who it was at that time. And so um, that's part of the reason we talk about this is because there's an important part about finding out what's going on. So you don't know for sure if the, if the guy was just someone just resting or uh, from being homeless or um, on some kind of a, a, a drug or something like that. Uh, no one had contact with him. He just wandered off. Yeah, no, nobody official had contact with them. Um, just one of a couple of the neighbors, you know, called out to the person. And so then he left the area. You know, we don't yeah. know 
and this this was sort of like this happened and then the neighbor thought hmm i wonder if that was the best way to handle this and so that's why they brought it to the table yeah okay did i does that help ron it did thank you okay other questions, let's see, were there any questions in the chat that I should look at? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Gosh, I, I can't believe I was that complete. Mike. One of the things that I'm impressed with, uh, and it seems to be overlooked, is that these kinds of multidisciplinary approaches with a broad spectrum of community resources uh, doesn't focus solely on police doing something. And uh, this is an issue that has come up a number of times uh, across the CPCs that uh, our recommendations should be focused solely on what APD needs to do. And uh, we're looking at ways to broaden the community engagement and response so that uh, we can bring in, you know, solid waste to clean up stuff in the neighborhood that will reduce the attractiveness for, um, you know, people that uh, are maybe dumping trash because they're they're lazy or or uh, maybe they're homeless and they don't have any place to dispose of trash and so forth. So th it will be an ongoing discussion uh, among various CPCs about how to adapt to this and in particular how to address it in our recommendations for, I, I call it, a gr fostering greater public safety and prosperity. So it's not simply law enforcement. So I'll leave it at that. So um, I have to uh, give uh, Commander Langett creds for participating really actively in each of these sessions. And he always brings incredible information to the table and helps clarify um, issues. Um, but it is great to be able to point out to people that um, uh, you don't talk too much. You always really help clarify things that, that we all need to understand. I mean, it, it's building that understanding of how things work. Um, but I, I also think it's so important for people to understand that there should be a lot more uh, approaches to solving a problem before we call the police. Like, I know that there are some times our, our uh, emergency lines are tied up with people calling police for things that are like not, like probably your trash dumpster is not gone because somebody stole it. it. You know, you could call 311 and get your trash dumpster replaced. You don't have to call the police for that. Or, um, you know, there just are things that I, I think a lot of people haven't had that opportunity to really think it through and know that there are a lot of solutions out there and our, we, we have a lot of ways of helping everybody feel safer or feel more secure about what's going on around them. Um, and um, I, I can tell you, I've been doing this for two years and my brain has kind of exploded with all the information, who's doing what and all the different ways people can work together to just make our community healthier and safer and happier. So, and, and also now I know how awesome the police are for a lot of it. Can I add one so, thing to that, Maria? Sure. Um, and I like how it was said about, you know, we, we, we always talk about community policing, community policing. Um, and I, and I, I forgot who I was telling this to before, but in a way I just think of it as community. And a, an example that I can give is it started with the Coronado Park downtown. So it started down in the valley where um, all of the city departments basically came together weekly, a couple times a week um, to discuss issues and work out issues um, at Coronado Park. So you had solid ways, you had planning, you had zoning, you had ACS, uh, you had APD, you had city security. Um, you had all the, the, the players at the table, you know? So, um, and maybe this is just being technical in the weeds, um, community policing, yeah, we definitely have a, uh, a spoke and we have a role and responsibility, but um, everyone's absolutely right. I mean, there's so many 
different options now. And that's a good thing. I, I really truly believe that we're in a good place now here in 2022 where, you know, it's not just the police or the fire department that can respond. Now we have mental health providers, we have social service coordinators, you know, we have fire, we have paramedics. Um, we, there's a whole, you know, myriad of responders that are the best ones to respond. So um, what I really um, like about ECHO is that the education still, there's so many in our community that have no idea though, um, business, residential, and, and, and ECHO, in my, in my opinion, it kind of provides that education of, of, hey, what's available to help you in these type of situations. So Maria, you do a fantastic job with it. Kudos. Thank you. Thanks. Ron, uh, you have another question. Marie, I live in Knob Hill and um, uh, I'm a part of the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association. And I want you to know that the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association appreciates very much the ECHO program in Knob Hill and the work that's ongoing. Well, it is a pleasure partnering with the Neighborhood Association there. And um, we've been working with University Heights as well. And um, I think Parkland Hills has started participating. And so we'll definitely, um, ex you know, I will always work to expand um, the contact with uh, any of the residents um, who want to participate. Great, thank you. Absolutely. And Ron, you just let us know if you have any issues you need to bring to the table. We're always looking for good cases to okay. discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I appreciate it. It's you good bet. information. I, and I'll pop my contact info in the chat right now. And I'm happy to, and I called out Angel. He's presented uh, and done a great job too. Um, so it's uh, it's always great to have really good presenta presentations that help everybody understand what's going on. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Angel, do you want to um, introduce Renee? Yeah. So I wanted Renee to present herself because she is a she is a, 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 a gem and she is my colleague now. She is my counterpart in the violence intervention program. But she has a very uh very interesting story and uh you know like I, I since she came on it changed the whole dynamic of the program. Um I'll let her talk about that. But uh so I, I probably introduce you guys to Renee Chavez Maez. Well, what is the violence, violence intervention program for those of us who don't know? So the violence intervention program is a focused deterrence program that addresses gun violence with a, a public health approach. And by public health approach, I mean um, addressing the underlying root causes of why crime happens, addiction, uh, Gun, gun violence. So we specifically deal with gun violence, but you know, it's all rooted in poverty. So we try to help provide resources to the people that need them most in our community. And um, and uh, Renee really shines in that aspect. So uh, Renee, uh, if you'd like, take over. Thank you, Angel. Um, can everybody hear me pretty good? I'm, I'm on my, my device, good. Okay, and so if it starts getting like, uh, choppy, just let me know. I'll turn off my camera. I'm in the dark anyway. Sorry about that. Um, so like Angel said, my name is Renee Chavez Maez, and I am a certified peer support worker and a certified community health worker. Um, I'm also a returning citizen. I've been um, in transition for uh, three years. Um, I'm, going, I'm coming up on my third year anniversary. Um, so um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we started off with ECHO because um, uh, that's actually how my intervention came. Um, I was raised in the International District of Albuquerque, New Mexico. My mother moved us there when she got a divorce when I was really young. And, um, you know, uh, she got involved in drugs and, and, you know, it shattered our household and me and my siblings, uh, the whole household got broken up. Um, I was the oldest and I just, uh, you know, uh, learned how to basically survive in the international district um, the best way I knew how as a young girl. 
I spent a lot of time um, in juvenile detention since I was 12 years old. That was my first arrest. I got addicted to crack cocaine um, by the time I was 14. And so I was in and out of juvenile detention. I was, um, you know, the, the justice system was trying to intervene on my behalf um, by sending me to treatment centers and facilities um, around the state. And, um, you know, by the time I was 18 years old, um, I already had a, a full force addiction um, to, to crack cocaine. And so um, I was 18 years old and I, uh, I got my first sentence, a uh, five-year sentence. Um, and, you know, the crimes that I used to commit were like transferring and receiving stolen vehicles, things just basically to get around and try to support my habit. Um, so, you know, that, that started a, a, a pattern for me. Um, I, I found a sense of belonging when it came to uh, getting incarcerated or being locked up. Um, I, I, women, when they're incarcerated, uh, we create family units. And so um, it's, 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 a, the, it's the weirdest thing, you know, women inside you, you have moms and aunts and grandmas and sisters and brothers, and, you know, you just create this, this family inside. And so, you know, being that my, my family was so shattered outside, um, every time that, you know, I, I get put on probation, I could never make it past three months. 90 days was my hallmark. Like I couldn't, get past 90 days um, with my addiction. So, uh, you know, I did really good in prison. You know, I went to school. I, um, you know, I did the programs and the groups inside. But every time I was released, so I have 11 incarcerations. I've spent over 23 years in the New Mexico Women's Correctional Facility since I was 18 years old. Um, I will be coming up on my 45th birthday now. And um, like I had said previously, I'm, I'm three years out. So what's awesome is uh, we started off with Project Echo. And so I had uh, picked up a meth addiction, um, you know, one of those 11 incarcerations. And, and so um, I started using methamphetamines. I started experiencing that lifestyle. But again, I had never been out longer than 90 days. I, I couldn't complete a sentence um, because of that addiction. And, um, and, and because re-entry was such a big task for me, I would get a job and then I'd be in a halfway house. And I just, you know, um, back then it just wasn't like it is now, I, I think with services, or maybe I just didn't know how to access or navigate those pathways. So um, in 2000, and uh, seven, I um, was the last time I've ever, you know, committed a crime. And I was, um, so I was, I, I went back one day pregnant with my daughter. And it was, I, I believe it was, you know, when she started to grow in my belly. And, um, you know, I, I started to realize that, you know, I wanted to be her mother. And, you know, the woman in me, and the fighter in me realized that, you know, that, that maybe I wanted a life change. So with that combination and, you know, spiritually strong, I, I really got involved spiritually inside um, with, with, with sign and worship dance and all of those things. But what was really profound is in 2010, Project Echo ex, um, came in with the Peer Education Project. So when the Peer Education Project came in, um, they chose 10 of us um, from inside um, the staff members uh, made their selections and I was chosen to be trained 40 hours how to uh, train your peers so peer education. That was a game changer for me. I, uh, I embraced that right and so it was when I was studying addiction as a disease in the library that I had my aha moment so um, I realized that I, I wasn't a moral failure. And, and that I was dealing with something that was going on biologically and chemically in my mind. And not only did I discover that um, through that intervention that came in through Project ECHO, but um, I, I realized that all of the bad influence that I had gained inside by breaking the rules, fighting and doing all the things that just keep you in that cycle of violent 
violence, interpersonal violence, um, I had influence and I had a, you know, and, and I was able to use, you know, when I became a peer educator inside, people started to listen to me and I was a very good teacher. And, and so I had found something that, you know, I was, I felt like I was really good at. And so with that, I started writing programs for women inside um, that are still actually active in the New Mexico Department of Corrections today. And um, so about three years ago, I was, um, I was incarcerated. And uh, well, actually it was about five years ago because it was the first year of my incarceration. Again, the, the last incarceration that I did. And I was in Springer Correctional Facility and um, I was doing peer education inside and I was, um, so I was working in the church and I was, um, I wrote programs, right? I was writing clubs and I wrote a, a program uh, and I named it from the inside out. And it was a future focused pod where God is honored. And so I wrote it and it wouldn't get approved and it wouldn't get approved by the administration. But so I just tucked it away and I just kept working and I kept uh, leading and kept doing peer education. And so um, I, you know, in, in 2019, I got released in February and um, I started working for UNM Pathways through La Placita Institute, which is a, a nonprofit in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the South Valley. And um, that's when I got my certified peer support uh, certification and I got my certified community health worker. Um, but I was, I was actually housing through the Pathways program. I was housing hard to house populations um, at an astronomical rate, right? It was just, I had met a um, property manager and I was so passionate about it. Um, I was housing this one woman. She was, a, she was a senior citizen. She had a cat. She was living in her vehicle. Um, and she had been brutalized. She had been harmed. And so day and night, I worked on housing her. Nobody would house her because of her, because of her um, credit history and because she had left her, or broke a lease because of this brutalization. And so I would stay up. I mean, I would call and look through lists and work diligently to try to house her. And I met this property manager um, and, uh, and I, call, I call him my kingdom connection. And, you know, I filled up every unit he has wherever it is. And I, it doesn't matter where it is. I've filled it up. We've put people in there with vouchers, no vouchers, uh, people with good credit, no bad credit. But the, I say all that to say this. So one day he called me up and he said, Renee, how would you like to um, meet me over here? And so I went, I, I went down to this uh, particular house and, and I, it was a vacant house. And he says, how would you like to make this a halfway house? That was his verbiage. And I was just like, I was one year out um, and I was like, yes, like I could do this. Like I've done it 11 times. I've transitioned out of incarceration 11 times. I'm like a guru at this. And so um, lo and behold, that, that program from the inside out that I was writing and trying to get approved inside um, is now named Frontline Resurrection Women's Life Recovery Home. Uh, we, we have a five bedroom home that we serve women. So in April of 2020, we opened our doors um, the month after we got locked down for COVID throughout the world. And um, we've been full since that day. We are full now and we're actually opening um, another home. We, uh, February 1st, we'll be opening a seven bed home in addition to this one because we found that, you know, there is not, um, you know, there's, there's not a, a shortage of women uh, in, that need assistance um, and support in transition, whether it's from addiction, homelessness, incarceration, um, you know, domestic violence, um, just so many different situations throughout our city. And because of where I worked with Pathways, UNM Pathways and um, La Placita, New Beginnings Church, um, it's like I'm strategically placed to, you know, to be a, an inter intermediary for these women. Um, so in doing that work, um, you know, we've served uh, since 2020 uh, of April that we opened our doors. We've served over 25 women. Um, only four have, you know, uh, went back to prison that we know of. Um, you know, women are, are the women that, that come through Frontline Resurrection Women's Life Recovery Home are now 
uh, you know, they're working at, you know, jobs, sustainable jobs, you know, $15 or more, you know, benefits, getting vehicles, getting restored to their families. Um, and it's just, it's an amazing, amazing thing, especially, you know, from where I come from and where, you know, not just recently, you know, not, you know, it's not like it's been a long, long time. It's been three years next month and it's just been amazing. But while I was doing this work, um, you know, certified peer because, you know, ECHO was peer education. That was just my niche. Um, I'm passionate about, about lived experience. I'm passionate about the peer movement. Um, I got my education inside. I'm, I'm actually getting ready to finish my bachelor's and get my LSAA um, at the end of this semester. And, you know, um, while doing this work, I started working with the city of Albuquerque and lo and behold, um, they needed a peer support specialist um, or interventionist uh, working alongside Angel Garcia with the violence intervention program. And so, you know, Angel and I, there's no day that's the same in, in, in our, you know, in our Monday through Friday, you know, that we, we go bedside with hospital-based violence intervention, somebody who's been shot. And I call it the golden opportunity because they're laying there in that hospital bed. They, they, you know, can't get up and run out the door and get high or whatever the case scenario may be. And so when Angel and I are allowed to walk in um, after we get a referral, I'm allowed to pour out every ounce of my energy and every bit of my resource navigation experience um, and community connections that I possibly can. If we could just raise up one person at a time out of the violence, out of the addiction, out of the drugs, out of the poverty, you know, by putting them on a pathway like I was put on. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I talk fast and, you know, that's a lot in, in, in just a couple of short breaths. But, um, you know, right now, I guess you could say that women in transition is, is where um, my expertise lies. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, what, what's even more amazing is that, you know, uh, I've been restored to not only my community, but, you know, my husband, you, you know, my children, the things that were taken away from me because of my addiction, my choices and my, my life. Um, on the streets uh, ha has has all come back, plus all of these women in the women's home and the VIP working for the city. You know, it's just amazing what um, can happen, you know, when when somebody discovers their their true identity, but also um, is equipped with education and intervention and and mentoring. Right. I have I have mentors. I have you know, uh, other women who surround me, who teach me what it, what it looks like to go have tea, right? Um, you know, coming from the international district, you know, uh, sports, you know, I used to wear sports bras, baggies with a hat backwards, running up and down central in, you know, um, Tennessee over there in that area, you know, doing crazy things, you know, in stolen vehicles. And, and now I can go to St. John's Tea Room and, and, and really, you know, and I can show up on a Zoom call with Angel Garcia and with all of you. And so I'm just very grateful. And, um, you know, my, my prayer is that, you know, we could just continue to help those individuals that are stuck in these cycles, even if it's at one person at a time, you know, by, by community building education and, and just uh, working together for our city. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Angel, if you wanna take the wheel, thank you for listening. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Patrick Berry in the chat wanted to hear about the Trauma Recovery Center. Do uh, you wanna tell him, Renee? Or for the group, cause he knows about it. So if you could explain it to everybody else. Can I, yeah. So. So we know uh, with the Gateway Center, we're going to have, you know, the TRC or the Trauma Recovery Center. And I think that, you know, I am just in awe because what a place in space, um, you know, the Trauma Recovery Center is going to be a space and place that people, um, community members, individuals that experience violence, um, you know, whether it's domestic um, gun violence, uh, sexual violence, interpersonal violence, any kind of violence, 
um, you know, they're going to be, we're going to create a space where, you know, referral will come through and, and we will engage them, you know, in a clinical level, in a non-traditional level, um, and be able to strategically address the need of that individual based on what their needs are, what their culture is, what their ethnicity is, right? It's going to be culturally competent, but just a little snapshot of what it's going to look like. Um, so just recently, I looked out of our window um, where we overlook, our office overlooks Coronado Park. Um, so this is, this is trauma recovery and intervention at its finest. So, you know, Angel and I are up at the top. I look down and there's a woman and she's, uh, you know, by her tent and um you know just with all the urgency mustered up that you can imagine i run down there and 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 through the fence you know she sees me and 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 somebody i know from way back when i was in the sixth grade and um in the international district and uh she she i say her name she looks at me she recognizes me i hold her hands she had just been sexually brutalized um to a point where it was like um, she was in so much fear that she just needed to be rescued out of that park at that moment. I mean, she had already been medically seen, but she had nowhere to go. She had went back. So when I saw her, I mean, she left her tent, she left those bags, she left everything. I was able to engage other community resources that we have already in place. We got her out of there. We got her to safety. She's now uh, in frontline resurrection, women's life recovery. Um, and, 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 and even though she's, she's, she's experiencing massive trauma right now, um, this is the beginning of what it's going to look like, right? How do we connect them to, to organizations where she can feel safe, where she can receive therapy and healing and, and, and love, you know, and um, services and medication, whatever she needs. Um, I just went and checked on her, guys. I just went and checked on her, um, you know, because she had a wig on. She had a wig on and it was dirty. It was matted. The dirt on her skin was so thick. She had to bathe multiple times just to get the layers off. But I went over there and this is 24 hours later and she is beautiful. And she had a smile. She was folding her clothes. She wasn't she wasn't shaking. She wasn't running. She wasn't looking behind me like somebody was going to get her. And, and that's what trauma recovery is. And that's what our city has to look forward to um, in the future. I hope that was a snapshot. Yeah, thanks, Renee. Yeah, thank you, Renee. I appreciate that. Do we have any questions, additional questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Well, thank you, Renee. Um, I look forward to working with you as I work with Angel as well. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. An amazing story. Your life, international district, recovery, the whole, you ran the whole gamut. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on with our agenda so we don't run out of time. Let's see. Um, and that brings us actually to um, Commander Languid. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'd, I would like to just start off with a few quick updates. Um, for those of you that didn't know, just due to staffing concerns and making sure that there is coverage for 242 cops and 911 calls for service, the department made the decision to rebid our officers. So our officers actually bid this Wednesday. So the new bid will go into effect on February 12th. Um, I was pleased to see that we did retain a good chunk of the officers that currently work in the Southeast. Um, however, we do have some new officers coming in. So February 12th, um, that's when the new officers will start their shifts. They're gonna be working a 12 hour shift now. Um, with this type of schedule, the call volume, there should be more officers available to, to, to take the 911 calls. So this should be a good thing. Um, with that being said too, and, and, and Ron, you may appreciate this being a Knob Hill resident, um, the bike units are gonna be assigned to Knob Hill and they will be riding bikes every day um, come the new bid. 
So every day they will be out there riding bikes and uh, they will be interacting with the, the businesses and the residents of Knob Hill. And not just so much Knob Hill, pretty much from um, maybe even up to like Washington, all the way down to, to, to Presbyterian, Maine. So yeah, thank they're gonna you. Have, they're gonna have I, 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 I've seen the bike units and I've also seen the mounted units in our neighborhood. Right, right. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but we're going to have them out there every day. That's going to be their, 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 their mission. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, and also, it's going to be the bike units that are all going to be assigned to the Knob Hill Echo. Um, previously, the bike units were um, under PRT. However, I just felt like we, we, I, we as a department have put so much, and me as a commander, so much on PRT. Um, just so those guys don't get burnt out, um, I gotta I gotta take some stuff off their plate. So there's gonna be a separation of bikes and PRT, and bikes is gonna fully commit to uh, to to Knob Hill to include Echo. So Maria, you and I we can we can talk in the upcoming weeks to see how this transition will be. But you'll have some dedicated uh, bike officers. In fact, I'm gonna be testing for two uh, two more bike officers, so it should be a good thing. Um, I would also like to present some of the use of force statistics, our crime statistics, and our recruiting um, statistics, uh, just to give you guys a quick snapshot. Um, last month, we had a total of, I apologize, I'm reading off my phone. We had a total of uh, 8,665 incidents where officers responded to calls for service for the entire month of December. Um, in total, we had a total of 13 uses of force, um, three level one uses of force, nine level two uses of force, and one level three. So out of these 860, 600 incidents or contacts, um, 13 of those resulted in, in uses of force. Um, the crime categories, our, our, our biggest crime category in the, in the Southeast Area Command is going to be aggravated battery and assault for violent crime. Um, our, our criminal sexual penetration was down. Um, our robberies were down, but our aggravated batteries and assaults were up. And again, I don't have the breakdown. I mean, this can range from a simple battering assault all the way up to like an aggravated battering assault. Um, and just a quick comparison, I looked at the numbers for this month in, in January. So for the first 20 days of the year, um, we're at 112 aggravated batteries and assaults. That's the highest category we have um, for our violent crime category. Our, our criminal se sexual penetrations is at seven, our, our robberies are at seven, our commercial robberies are at 19, but yet our aggravated batteries and assaults are at 112. On the property crime side, it's gonna be the stolen vehicles. Um, so this is the type of information that is pushed to our officers of what we need to focus on. And just based off of the, um, Based off of the uh, reporting, we see the areas of where these uh, where, where these crimes are being uh, occurring. Um, not in every case, but a lot of times it's going to be repeat offenders that are committing these crimes, especially for the property crimes. Um, I don't have an exact breakdown. I have a couple theories on the aggravated batteries and assaults, but. For the property crimes, um, it's good to identify. We look at who's on probation and parole, who's been released in that area. We also look at those areas to see if there's any significant systems that are um, an underlying cause of, of, of why this particular area is a hub for crime. Um, and this is the information that's pushed to our officers so that they can focus their proactive initiatives um, at these areas. Um, there's an idea of disruption and displacement. Um, even if we can't disrupt the criminal element to completely shut it down, um, if we can um, disrupt it to at least it where um, it displaces a future burglary that might occur or a stolen vehicle that might occur, um, that's one less victim that's out there. Uh, real quick, I see a question. Can you explain the impact your PR teams are having? Our PRT teams are, are, are they are having a significant impact. In fact, I'm taking efforts to have them um, certified as federal task force officers um, so they can pursue um, gun, gun crimes, federal gun crimes. Um, it's, it's every week. I mean, these guys make arrests every day and these are legitimate um, 
individuals that 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 commit serious crimes um, that need to be arrested. Um, and it seems like every week these guys are, are pulling guns off of people. Um, so that's why we're looking into um, having them, at least a couple of them, become federal task force officers. Um, I'll give you an example. I know it came up earlier. I think Maria had, had mentioned it. Um, Walgreens, right? The Walgreens was, was, was robbed over there um, close to UNM and Knob Hill. Uh, it was PRT actually that found the individual, Roland Ruiz, 6484. He uh, actually, not only was he good for two Walgreens robberies, but he also was responsible for, uh, for two gas station robberies as well. So it was, it was our PRT officers that, that found him. They worked with robbery, able to get warrants, and robbery took the case, and we were able to apprehend that, uh, that, that commercial robber. So our PRT office, officers are doing a great job. They're very proactive. They have a, a, a pop project um, in the international district. Um, they really use utilize the technology that we as a department have provided for them to include like our gunshot detection. Um, they're looking at um, where the shots are being fired. They're looking at um, where the reports are being made and they're using that in their assessments when they go out and they, uh, and they, they try to stop and progress crimes. Getting back real quick um, to PRT is the wave of future for policing. That, that, I mean, I like that. I mean, PRT is very motivated. They make arrests every day, but what's important, I don't know if everyone knows this, um, PRT also does significant outreach in the community as well. Um, they work with, with, with Susie on a regular basis. They, they go out there, they help provide meals to the less fortunate in our community. They go out there and they provide um, supplies as well, you know, especially with it being cold. I mean, now's the time to to really help out the less fortunate. So um, I think it's I think it's really cool that at least once a week they they put that time in to to in their to make time in their schedules to provide that outreach um, to all walks of life in the Southeast Area Command. I think that's really cool and important. The define the acronym PRT. It's the Project Response Team. Um, Get, getting real back to our crime stats, though, so aggravated batteries and assaults. That's what the focus needs to be on, um, because looking at the homicide statistics, I've done a couple sh community shooting reviews. I don't know if anyone on here has attended them. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure we'll have more. I hate to say it like that, but I think it's important that we provide, um, you know, what happened you know, and provide that to the residents that live in that area and who I'm sure have questions about, well, what was the causes? I mean, what happened? Are they safe, right? Um, interesting statistic that I noticed just looking at the Southeast homicides is uh, individual disrespect. I mean, that motivation um, is pretty high, you know, especially in the Southeast. So I look at, you know, when we have, you know, over a hundred instances of aggravated assaults and batteries, you know, my biggest fear is, is that they could escalate further and then we have another homicide. So um, this is why I need our officers to do proactive stops to um, make these stops before the individuals would perhaps get together and then end up in an aggravated assault altercation, right? Um, kind of that disruption. Um, and, that, and that has a place and it's effective. Will it solve the entire problem? Probably not, but it does have a place. Um, on the other end, and again, I, I really don't want, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record because I know I've been talking about this for the last couple of months, but that's where I feel that we really need to educate the community. And I really want to start at the bid again, February 12th. I want to start with all the neighborhood associations, um, provide them with the restorative justice and conflict mediation training um, to where if, if, if an altercation does happen, and, and, and we give them this piece of, you know, training or information and that could help um, diffuse it. You know, if that's one potential aggravated battery or potential homicide that we prevented, it's a success in my opinion. So I think we need to try um, both strategies um, to see if we can make that difference. So that's what we're gonna do for, for this year. Um, real quick, I don't wanna take up too much time. I know you guys have, more on the agenda. I would like to provide you with where we're at as a department with recruiting. I know this is pretty important. So right now, um, CNM class six, currently they have seated 12 
um, cadets. Uh, APD class 125 is currently seated at 31 cadets. CNM7, which hasn't started, uh, is currently seated for two. Then we also have a 40th PSA class where there's 10 seated for it. There's a uh, lateral class. It's going to be the 28th lateral class. We have five currently in the background. However, there's a total of seven qualified applicants. And the 126 cadet class, um, they're still aggressively in the process of uh, finalizing that class. Um, we have 18 that's passed the chief selection. They just have to continue with the physical fitness and the medical. There's 24 that's currently in backgrounds and there's a total of 173 qualified applicants. So just an idea of you know, where we're at as a department um, with bringing new officers onto the department. Um, with that, I will, let me look at my agenda. I'll stand for any questions. I know that was short and sweet. Thank you, Commander. So, <clears throat> Commander, you uh, had a uh, shooting review last Wednesday. Was that your second or was it uh, a subsequent uh, shooting review? No, that was our second shooting review. And that was actually at the request of the residents that live in that area. And uh, one of the questions I kind of posed is like, well, when do you do a shooting review? Do you do it the next day? Do you do it when the case is concluded? There's no right answer. You know, um, if, if the community, if, if you as a resident, want to have a shooting review and you want me to tell you what happened we'll, we'll have one and then even if the case isn't concluded and then when that case is concluded if we need to do another one i'll do another one um i think all of you are aware that the southeast substation is being remodeled thankfully for you from your tax dollars um and hopefully in a month or two we should be moving into the new building then they're going to bulldoze the existing building and then they're going to start phase two they're going to start building it's going to be one beautiful facility when it's done it is gonna have like a 50, 60 person community room when it is done. Um, so uh, I, I think there's definitely benefits to having a, a community shooting review in the community, right? Now, if there are residents where it's like, hey, I don't, I don't, I don't want 50 people in my house, um, we'll have a community room at the substation where, you know, anytime that we can bring community together and Again, our goal is to reduce shooting, so hopefully we don't have too many shooting reviews, but anytime that we can bring community together, let's, let's use that room every day. I'm all for it. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Oh. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for your service. I'm going uh, to log off. I'm, Feeling under the weather, weather, so I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Commander. Have a good evening. All right. All right. Um, next, we have um, the review uh, of the October minutes, which I resent out um, a little late, so I apologize, um, so that people didn't have to dig in their emails to get those from back in November. Um, so um, if you all have had a chance to look at those, that would be great. And see if there are any adjustments that need to be made. I didn't see any, but I'm just one set of old eyes, so. Did council have a chance to look at those? I miss seeing them. When did you send those out, Susie? I, I resent them um, this evening just because I realized as I was went looking for them again that it would have been back in November. So I resent them out. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been on the email since uh, I had dinner before the meeting. Uh-huh. 
Maybe we can table this until we get to an executive chat or something. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Okay. Let's see. Ah, I just lost my agenda. Um, let's see. As far as new business, I know Mike, you wanted to have a minute. Okay, I uh, I'll have to find the. Uh, info that I was going to send. So, uh, Maria, you mentioned in one of your uh, tables about homelessness as being one of the issues that uh, uh, comes up often. For those of you who are not aware, there's a uh, an annual, I believe, uh, what's called point in time survey or census of people living in shelters or uh, being unsheltered. And if you are interested in collaborating, supporting uh, the, uh, let, me, let me make sure I get uh, this all copied into the chat, uh, you can, get trained next week. So uh, training sessions for uh, supporting the coalition to end homelessness and healthcare for the homeless and a variety of other um, folks working on the streets. Sorry, scam call. Uh, <clears throat> all the information that you need is uh, there in chat. Get in touch with uh, Lucy at uh, Coalition and Homelessness. And the survey is done Tuesday through Friday, first week of February. So that's that's it for that. Did I make my two minute uh, deadline? Angel, yes. Hey, Mike, um, would it would it be helpful if? We connected Lucy to uh, the Civic Engagement Department. They have over twelve thousand volunteers, and they could probably help her create a volunteer a volunteer event where people could sign up to go help her out. You know, I will take that as a note. To try to get in touch with her tomorrow. Okay, and uh, you have my email. If you need me to put you guys in contact with uh, the the person from the Civic Engagement Department, just email me, and then uh, uh, we'll make that introduction. Okay, that would be great. I think they were surprised that uh, we decided to try to publicize this opportunity to volunteer. And that's great information. Thank you so much. You know, Mike, they weren't able to do that uh, last year because of COVID. So this is a really important year to get an accurate count. Definitely, definitely. Thanks for that, Mike. And then I'm going to actually turn it over to you, Mike, to do the um, the overview of the strategic plan. Since you are well more versed at that than uh, what I am at this point. I'm hoping that the screen share works uh, as well as we had practiced before the meeting. And I'm going to make this very brief. Um, let me screen share. Okay. Um, I'm hoping I get the right. There we go. Um, so I have uh, created a, a public folder for uh, all sorts of information that uh, the community can reach. Uh, I'm going to start with this document. I'm going to scroll right to the end. Here's the reality of uh, CPC workload. And I know a lot of people don't like me saying this, uh, but we've got roughly 200 square miles in the city of Albuquerque. We've got over a uh, half million population. We have 47 CPC members as of a year ago. And uh, according to the ordinance, 11 members per uh, CPC, per six CPCs. There's a lot of work to be done by 66 people. So what uh, we're trying to do is uh, build on the previous uh, summits. The summits uh, were held quarterly uh, with all sorts of public uh, engagement uh, up through September 
2019. And we were going to build on that in January 2020. And then, of course, COVID hit and we needed to uh, revise our plans. So we still have in mind the idea of town hall meetings and summits uh, in the future. So I'm going to jump into the strategic plan. Uh, we we'll talk about the five priorities and the goals uh, underneath them, 13 different goals, and then about 70 action items that uh, we're looking for community engagement. This current draft uh, was developed over about a year's time, and we had the uh, generous support of the city to get a uh, management consultant to help us build this. Uh, in this process, uh, we were also doing the uh, ordinance and the guidelines. Uh, at that very same, same time, the uh, ordinance was approved in September, September 21st, uh, 2020. So uh, as a result of all of that work on the strategic plan, uh, the chairs decided to meet on a monthly basis formally. They had been meeting for several years, sort of informally working on guidelines instead of bylaws. And uh, we tried to make, uh, make things a little bit uh, less bureaucratic. So I'm gonna jump into a um, real quick overview. Let's see if this will work here. Let's try to do a slideshow. There we are. Um, Okay, uh, Eric Jackson, who's no longer with the Council of Chairs or with the Northwest uh, CPC, uh, developed this to familiarize our members, and I'm sharing it with the community. Um, we uh, had this history of the strategic planning sessions. We had the, uh, the great uh, support of a professional management consultant. Uh, it was a... a a year-long process. Here's what I'm going to jump to. Uh, five strategic priorities. Uh, operational efficiencies, sustainability, collaboration, partnerships. Um, the, the important ones, uh, member diversity and accountability and transparency. Um, we all have different opinions about what's most important. Um, so, as we went through this process, we developed uh, goals for each of the priorities. I will jump through these very quickly um, because all of this information is available online. I'm going to provide you the links so that you can look at them without uh, me blabbing too long. Um, so as I said, five top priorities. 13 goals uh, underneath those and associated with each of those goals are a number of uh, action items that we're looking for um, engagement from, from the community because there's a lot of work to be done. We want to hear what you have to say about what we need to do, about your ideas, your strengths uh, that you can bring to the process. So let's see here, I get out of that. Whoops, there we go. So I'm gonna jump to the very first, uh, I mentioned the uh, ordinance. That was quite a long process. We worked with city legal, um, it was signed. Here we go into uh, effectiveness. 21st of September, it was approved nine to zero and it was signed by the mayor. So that's uh, in effect right now. And that establishes the CPCs past the end of the CASA. Um, so this is a quick look. You can, I will give you the links to these, um, these several uh, 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 forms or surveys that I created uh, and these, you can go through and say, hey, I've looked at the strategic plan. Uh, I think operational efficiency is the most important. I think marketing and branding uh, is the least important. You can give us some comments on that. 
Uh, this is the same sort of evaluation that our CPC members passed and new members uh, are able to, to provide us. Same sort of feedback. Here is a, uh, a quick entry into the working groups. The, the Council of Chairs uh, is established to collaborate, communicate among the CPCs so that we uh, are on the same page as much as possible. We can't always be, but uh, <clears throat> we uh, have committees to address each of these uh, priorities. We're also looking for community members that, you know, like if you have a special strength in writing or in video production or in creating surveys, uh, we would love to have your thoughts on uh, and help. So this uh, survey will allow you to say, I'm interested in doing it. We're trying to set some ground rules on how to be uh, cordial and civil with one another. Finally, um, here is the first of five strategic priority surveys, and you can go to any one of these and say, yes, I'll collaborate on this one. I'll collaborate on this one, uh, and that'll be the end of it. You can uh, agree to support none or many. If you're a community member, we would love to have your engagement in uh, working groups to help us broaden our, our understanding of what you need and uh, how we can work better for you and community at large. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing. I'm going to dump all this these links into the chat. And um, unless there are questions, I will mute myself. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Not the muting part, but going over the, <laughs> going over everything for us. I appreciate that. Um, do we have any questions from anybody about that from the council? Let me before we we uh, close down. Let me make sure I get all those links into the chat. No problem. No problem. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the community? Uh, while well, Mike's putting that information in the chat. Is that a question, Angel? Or are you... <laughs> okay. Well, oh. right. Well, um, we'll wait for up. Oh, there we go. Got that up. Thank you, Mike, for getting that up. By the way, uh, we try to make this simple for the public. Uh, we know that we had the resources of the city website, but uh, there's a lot more flexibility in using uh, Google Drive. And I use the short uh, 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 links wherever possible. So that one, tinyurl.com CPC ABQ public two. That's the easiest way to get to all of this information. And uh, those two surveys that I uh, showed you, the form, you know, what are your thoughts about the priorities and what do, what do you want to do to get started? So there you are. Thank you. Right. Um, well, if we have nothing else or no more comments or questions, then we will adjourn our meeting and go into executive session. So we thank all the members of the community, um, all of our panelists. Um, we appreciate you. Um, oh, there's a question. Is there a timeline for completion? I'm guessing that's for your questionnaires maybe, Mike? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, this is an ongoing process. Um, we believe that uh, the strategic plan needs many, many updates and revisions as we discover where we have common ground and where we have disagreement. But as far as uh, completion of any of those uh, surveys or the forms, 
to engage in a working group. No, that is an ongoing process, and I will try to stay on top of responses and get back in touch with community members. Does that answer the question? Dr. Rickman? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, if we have no more questions, um, then uh, we'll adjourn and go to executive session. Thanks to APA and the public for attending tonight. We will see you in four weeks. And CPC members stay on, please. Did someone leave? Um, uh, no, I guess not. Okay. Oh, no. Angel just turned his camera off. You just wanted us to see that that picture of you, huh? We we're standing there all. <laughs> Welcome back, Angel. All right. Um, so as far as our executive session goes, I know that um, that uh, in January is when we do elections of officers for the council. So. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you want to guide us through this because I did not do this last year, so. Okay, uh, I guess we can make it fairly simple. There are two officer positions plus a secretary if you'd like to appoint one. Um, let's see, as for uh, chair for 2022 of the Southeast Council, uh, do we have who, who would like to be the chair of the Southeast Council? We have any volunteers, and that includes everyone, all all five people. So I, I'm going to say this: uh, we didn't do intros uh, this evening of the members, and that's okay. Um, I'm beginning my sixth year, and uh, normally at the end of th January next year, it would be time to step down. And uh, I guess in uh, accordance with guidelines uh, or the ordinance rather, uh, that uh, six year completion is extended to September, 2023. So uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, anticipating being in my last year and uh, Hopefully beyond that, uh, I'll get engaged in some of the community working groups and so forth. Um, I don't mind if I serve as vice chair or chair. Uh, I'll take uh, that uh, responsibility if people so choose. So I would like to nominate Mike Krachowski as our chairperson for this year, 2022. Okay. Are there any other candidates? Okay. Is there anyone who objects? Well, uh, is it you are asking for nominations or volunteers, <laughs> Kelly? <laughs> well, I mean, if there, got, if there are two people who want to be the chair, then we have to have an election, right? You got nominated, Mike. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Vice chair for 2022. Slightly I, nominate, I, nominate, I nominate Susie for vice chair. Susie for vice chair. Would you like to accept the position, Susie? I'm certainly willing to do that, yes. Okay. Any objections? All right. Well, we have our officers for 2022. I don't know if you can be a CPC secretary and a chair as well, Mike, but I guess we'll address that this weekend. Um, I'll nominate Angelo for secretary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, we never hear Angelo talk. Let's give him a job. He's the guy with all the uh, marketing skills to young people. I know. All right. 
Okay, we'll find some we'll find some good stuff for you to do so we can get 50 people in each meeting. Ron? I have a, a question. Um, uh, as soon as he sent out the resumes for five different people, uh, that at one point or time or another, well, I guess you sent those out, Kelly. Uh, uh, has anyone contacted any of these folks about it? I, I, yes. Um, I actually, um, when they came in, contacted people, um, uh, and I went on, they were sent back out again. Excuse me, Athena wants to, or three seconds of fame. Um, um, you know, we can certainly recontact them, but I, I did contact them um, at that time. Um, I do have um, a retired police officer that has reached out to me and he's interested in, in um, speaking with us about possibility of being on the council and then um, as well as the gentleman from the Foothills Council um, that is now in our area command. So we do have a couple of people that um, um, that uh, we need to be looking at and interviewing. And, and do we have those resumes for those two people? Um, no. Did the gentleman from the Foothills, Kelly, send one? Yeah, yeah, I'll, okay, I'll forward it to everyone. Uh, okay. And that was the only one I sent out last week, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So we have one plus the person we know. Uh, right. I, I'm staying with calling the executive chat, and uh, we will uh, get to meet them and see what happens. How about that? That'll work. Is there any day that doesn't work for anyone here? Uh, I'll uh, Kelly. I'll go ahead and create the doodle poll, and then you know we'll get the best. Best uh, dates for the most people, but uh, there's also Marcia Chastine, the lawyer who was at the block party. Where was it? At Johnny Tapia Community Center. Um, has she been in touch at all, or have you contacted her? Uh, I have contacted everyone from the block party. I have received a couple of uh, responses, but not from her, no. I, I will reach out to her and apologize for the lawyer jokes that I told her. All right. Oh. Thanks, Mike. Uh, okay, I mean, well, since we're all here tonight, is there, I know, Ron, you sing in the choir one night. What night is that? Uh, Wednesday, my, Wednesday nights are out, of, out from me for any kind of a meeting. Okay. I have total mm -hmm. commitment to my church. Is there anyone here who has another night that cannot meet on? I can't do the second Thursday of the month that I have a board meeting um, that night, but it's just the one Thursday. Okay. Um, so every, every Wednesday for the next 15 weeks, I have class from 4.30 to 7, and that's after a full day of work. So. Probably Wednesdays, I just want to come home, eat, probably crash, you know? Okay. Yes. So Monday, yeah. Monday, I, I, I weigh uh, in. Uh, I'm still looking at my schedule for my classes on, like, to see what's coming up. Okay. So, Mike, you don't have, you have open availability every night. Monday and Tuesday works for the most part for everyone. So I'll, I'll go ahead and set up the, the little poll and make a, uh, um, a length of time, two and a half weeks or thereabouts, give us some time to, to breathe and then give us some time to be prepared for the uh, next month's monthly meeting. Um, yeah, there are no good nights for me, period, but, at all. Uh, but Wednesdays are the worst. Yeah, okay. Wednesday. I'm, I'm thinking of setting up a monthly chat so we can get the agenda in a little bit earlier. We can start getting it on the Office of Neighborhood Communication Board and maybe we can get some information in the uh, Area Command newsletter if there is one in the Southeast. I don't remember. It goes out monthly in the Area Command newsletter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, uh, yeah, Mike, get back to me and uh, we will set up a monthly meeting. And we'll get the uh, people invited and we'll get 
the uh, election going, okay? I, I mean, not the election, the, uh, the meet and greet. Are, are, we gonna, are we going to do uh, interviews with uh, uh, the people that have submitted uh, applications to serve that have still an interest in serving on the, could we do a Zoom interview? Well, well that's what I'm thinking about the next yeah. executive. Okay. Chat. And, and okay, Susie, I'll send you the link, the link to uh, put in the application so the, the ex officer can just make okay. it official, okay? All right, that, thank you. All right. All right, wow, we, we have 15 minutes to spare. <laughs> That's nice. It is, it is. All right, well, um, unless somebody else has something, I'm down to have an, an extra 15 minutes this evening. I second that. <laughs> and the cats are like waiting for me to feed them. <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone. Lovely seeing everyone this month. It was a good meeting. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Night. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, since I'm an executive uh, council chair, oh, 